Hey everyone, welcome to today's video. So today's video, I'm going to be discussing something that is probably going to hit the core of so much. And this is the one video where I would say if your feelings get hurt easily, then get ready for that to happen because there are things that I feel like we have to talk about because there's a side of the community that's feeling these things. And even though for the most part, uh, as a YouTuber, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I feel these things. At least I see them and I feel like they're worth talking about. Now, this video, I titled it three hard lessons that I learned from the Division franchise. Um, many people are not going to like me for this one, but, you know, it's one of the things that I feel like if you don't like anything that I say, I'm, I invite you to actually try to rebut it or, you know, try to counter it in the comment section. We can have a civil conversation about these issues. So the very first hard lesson that I learned about the division two and the division itself, the, the entire franchise, um, is that game development is a mess. The way games are developed in today's world um, with the competition, the availability of technology, um, you know, the cutthroat world that everything is in. I feel like a lot of game development companies have bought into uh, some kind of a pattern to just ship a game regardless. I feel like that's one of the, the downsides of game development. I feel like, you know, publishing companies have an agenda, shareholders are there, and most of the time they don't consider uh, what will happen on the back end because they know players are, you know, into the hype, people have pre-ordered, and there's just this foundation for them to release broken games or release games that probably don't have a good value proposition behind it. And so in the case of The Division 2, they released the, you know, the game and they said, oh, you know, the very first year is uh, all the content for year one is going to be free. And, you know, it's free for everybody. But still, when they sold a season pass, they put a few things that season pass holders were actually going to get. They were going to do stash size changes. They were, you know, for people who had maybe the ultimate edition, you were going to be able to get extra stash space. But people, you know, roared and said, why should other people get stash size, and you know, extra stash space? And so that, that's the thing. It's just this mess that was just going on. And, you know, it just happened to be that. On the back end, they decided that, you know, the PR, the marketing and all that didn't look good. They didn't want to offend anybody and step on toes. They wanted to ship this game because the first game had gone through a lot of turmoil. They sold a bunch of copies, but they didn't have a, a solid game. And now they were doing another game. And so the entire thing, I think, was just a rollout that pretty much could have crashed way early. But something happened. And that was the saving grace for the Division 2. This game is the luckiest game in the world. And that was Anthem, which was another mess on its own. Anthem came out in February and it was discovered that that game was not ready, was actually a bigger case of a botched system. And so what you had was everybody focused negative attention on Anthem and somehow Tom Clancy's The Division 2 scaled through. And even though it scaled through, we have to give credit and say level one through level 30 grind was actually a solid piece of work. You know, that's the that's one of the first things that we have to, you know, say. And so with all of this, the game still kind of came out, you know, strong. And then it was discovered the end game content that they were talking about when they were marketing the game was not ready. And that's exactly one of the problems that a lot of people had initially. But people waited. They farmed all they needed to farm. They kind of stayed in with the whole, uh, you know, uh, game sequence and release cycle. And then they started to drop the, they dropped the raid and then they started dropping the episodes. And a lot of people said, is this what we paid for? Seven day early access classified missions and whatnot. These classified missions are even time gated. So something that you paid for, you have to still wait for it, even though it's exclusive to you. It's exclusive to you for one run, which is really weird. And so already that was a failed proposition. Already that was just right off the bat. The year one pass, I think, is the biggest failed proposition ever because they charged money for it. And in that sense, that did not fulfill, in my opinion, what a say an extra $30 or $20 should have fulfilled. Because if you think about the comparison of the year one pass, the game was maybe $50, $59.99, 60, dollars and you paid $120 for this game. You got a few extra items. But then other than that, 
the new the New York expansion is only worth thirty dollars, and that's supposed to be five missions, all these really cool stuff, new exotics. I mean, which is going to be coming for you know, I think it'll be available for everybody. But there seems to be a whole lot more for thirty for thirty dollars than there was for your sixty dollar extra that you paid if you paid for the ultimate edition. So that's where the scales don't match, and I feel like that was a hard lesson to learn. Now, I bought the gold edition because I don't buy ultimate editions of games as much as I'm a YouTuber, as much as I'm a fan. I don't buy ultimate editions because I had always been kind of cautious from hearing stories of people who bought ultimate editions or it was gold in the division one. I don't think they had an ultimate uh, edition. Then I think it was just a gold edition that cost about one hundred and ten dollars. And I heard people telling nightmare stories. And that's when I was like, huh. I'll stick with the middle ground, which was the gold in this case, and I paid $80 or so or $90 for the game uh, because I also wanted to get the early access. So from the perspective of a YouTuber, I was fine. I'm going to be honest with you guys. You know, you guys are great. You're amazing. You watch videos. And so there was a turnover, you know, for getting that money back. But if you think about it from a consumer perspective, even though you may not, as a YouTuber, you may not be in that situation, just take a pen and a paper and do the math, and that's when you're going to see why people feel like they got cheated in that proposition. And so that, in my opinion, was lesson number one. So as much as I was really excited about the game, I also made a disclaimer video, and I'm glad that I actually made that video because it was just out of nowhere. Something said to make that video, and I made that video before the game was released during the beta, and I said... We hardcore division agents are ready to jump into this game head on, regardless of the issues that we may encounter in front of us. And I am so glad that I said that because when I was making all my videos, whenever I'd make a positive video and whenever I made a negative video, people would hop on the channel and I would get critique on both ends. But that video was my declaration of what I was doing in this game. And I just stuck with it. And it's taught me a very, very, very serious lesson that whenever I'm going into something, I need to kind of define what it is that I'm stepping into, because even though I may not know, I need to at least tell myself, OK, if I'm going to be stepping into this mud, I need to be willing to say I was stupid enough to make this mistake or smart enough to follow this proposition. And so that was lesson number one, seven minutes. You see where this video is going? <laughs> lesson number two is that no game is perfect. Um, I wanted this point to actually be le lesson number three to do like the sandwich method, uh, you know, and slap the most uh, thick critique in the middle of the video. But I thought, no, uh, that needs to come to the end. And, you know, no game is perfect. If you go look at every single game, they have their quirks and they have their qualms. But what is, uh, you know, important is if a development team slash publishing company is interested in serving their community, then they will deliver a close to perfect game in any sense because they have to go back and do things that will make, you know, the community happy. They have to do that. I remember when Mortal Kombat 11 came out, you could tell that there was a little bit of greed in the implementation of how they wanted to do the microtransactions because these games, uh, they usually work with an in-game economy. You don't really, you don't have to spend any money in these games, honestly. Uh, you can grind and just play and over time, you can earn almost every single thing in the game. Almost, you can't earn everything because some things are based on merit. Like you have to fight and, you know, get those things by playing the game. Some things you can buy from a store. But having gone back to look at Mortal Kombat 11, the way they did it, when people said, this is a grind economy, they came out on the forefront, they gave out a whole bunch of currency and said, we don't want players to feel like there's a grind fest. Even though we want you to work for these things, we respect the community and the community is not feeling like they're respected. Well, how this is how we're going to make it right. They stepped in front of it and they handled their business. They handled their business. Many times, games like these, the division taught me a lesson that not every developer is actually like that. Sometimes development teams cannot break away from the corporate mold and, you know, calm the flames in initially. Massive is one of those studios. They follow their timetable and their agenda, and this can be very frustrating for a lot of players. On the back end, this whole year, two stuff was happening. I was making all these videos and I didn't know, but having had a little bit of experience with them, it was kind of still 
under my mind somewhere, but just a small light of hope that these guys were working on this game. Because a lot of people kept commenting on my videos saying, I just don't feel like they have this game on their agenda. I feel like they're moving on to next gen. I feel like they're moving on to Avatar. But I started looking much closely and I said, there's just no indication that they're abandoning this game. Yes, they're working on Avatar, which is something that many Ubisoft studios would do. They'll work on multiple games at the same time. But I didn't think that there was a third project that they were working on. There might be a third project. I don't know. Um, but I just kind of held off a little bit, even through the frustration. And that taught me to just hold on and just plant your feet steadfast and say, not all game development firms will handle things to get the same way. But this team are usually confident about the way they want to do a bounce back. And so... Game development is just an imperfect process that we as gamers are going to have to live with right now. Um, but nonetheless, there are development teams that always want to push against that mindset. So I'm not saying no game development process is perfect. So let's throw our hands in the air and let's exit the room. Nope. That will be very irresponsible of me because there are studios like CD Projekt Red who delayed Cyberpunk 2077 and not only did they earn more respect from the community, they earned more admiration from them. And so even more people are now thinking to themselves, since this game got delayed, even though there was a little bit of disappointment, you know, we can still say this community, this game development firm wants to get the formula right they want to make sure that the game comes out and everybody can experience the game very well and not worry about maybe the PC community getting a fresh, you know, version and then maybe the, you know, the Xbox getting a, a broken version. In a Division 2, PlayStation 4 were at the brunt of a lot of uh, the game's uh, inability to be optimized properly through the various PlayStation 4 systems. And so there was a problem with a lot of things like invisible walls uh, and all of that stuff. And I don't know who was looking and testing the console stuff, but how they did not catch these things, how these things did not surface, I don't, I don't know what the QA process is. So that gives me one huge lesson, expect the unexpected, because I wish they had taken some time to actually amend these things and make sure that these bugs were not there. The game would have had a much more smooth sale and the community would have at least not had to worry about something like that in the long run. Because yes, I understand that software development can be really, really a pain. I use all kinds of software. I'm a software guy. You know, I've talked to my my, my buddies that we play on PC together and, every, you know, every one of them, you know, they have these mega monster PCs that are just beautiful. But me and my own, you know, my own kind of thing that I go after is software, the best optimized software. And, you know, making videos sometimes, software will crash on you. You guys are here. The last video that I made uh, a few videos ago, it just got you guys one second of audio and then the rest of it just, you know, was silent because the, you know, my editing software just decided it was going to do nonsense. And so software, you know, development is a problem, can be a problem if you don't take your time to optimize your software. And even though we may say game development is an imperfect process, at least, at least a development team needs to be able to figure out how they're going to solve these issues as fast as possible, you know, in, in my opinion. And so that's the second lesson. And then the final lesson, which is something that I feel like we need to talk about is, I learned that most gamers, you know, need to be able to exercise a little bit more patience. Now, those of you who waited for the Division 2 to go on sale, uh, you're probably in the best possible situation financially. That means your investment here uh, for so much gameplay and so much game quality is maximized. Because if you pay the $3 to come in right now, that is the best possible deal you can get the Division 4. Some people got it for free. They bought a, you know, a GPU or they bought a CPU or they bought like a computer part and they threw it in there for them. So that's also another really good deal that you could have gotten. Uh, you know, maybe somebody got it as a gift on, on a giveaway. They want it. And so those are also good deals. But then those of us who paid day one, you know, if you look at the math, we can definitely see that, you know, if you paid $80 for this game and then you're going to pay $30, you're now at $120 in terms of your total financial cost. 
And then the person who paid three dollars and, you know, comes in and pays about forty dollars to get the entire thing with the year two and all, you know, almost all of everything in year one, except the classified assignments and a few, uh, you know, cosmetic things. They're going to be paying pretty much a third of what you paid and they're going to get, you know, pretty much very similar experience. And that's why I said a lot of gamers need to learn to be patient. Now, it's very difficult because guys like me are going to be making videos that are going to get you hyped. I'm not going to stop making those videos. I'm sorry because I like the game. I am on the forefront of what it means to be in a gaming community and what it means to actually go through the entire uh, the entirety of the process. And so somebody like me, I may have, you know, uh, I may try to give a uh, an unbiased opinion, but there is no one that doesn't have a bias. I have a bias. I have a bias over the division, over any other RPG or any other shooter game out there. Like I'm just naturally biased to the game because I like the game. The game has a sentimental part of my life, which I've spent time developing a community, developing a channel around. That kind of investment is very difficult to be parted away from easily. And so you can take my videos and my hype, but you have to take it with a grain of salt and hold on to your wallet. Because even though day one, I'm one of the guys that, you know, you'll be expecting to go ahead and take one for the team. That's exactly what my job is. I go in there, I check it out, I take one for the team and you come out and say, okay, how does it look? And if you see how it looks, then you can say, sure, okay, I'm, I'm going to jump right in. We're supposed to be the test subjects. That's what I think YouTubers are for. That's what I use YouTubers for. Even other YouTubers who cover other games that I might be interested in playing, all I do is I just sit there and just listen to them, watch them play the game. If I like the game, I go for it. If, I don't, if I'm not sure, if I don't like the game, then I put the game aside. And so what I would say is trust but verify. Another thing too is even holding on to your money, if the hype is really, really strong within you, you're most likely going to get a sale. Go look at every major release that's come out in, that came out in 2019 and look at from the day they came out all the way through even three months after they came out. Go look at every major game and look at their price points from release to three months and see how much of a discount these games got. The Division came out in March, and by December, the game was literally, you could get your hands, you know, on the game for about $5 on the Epic Games Store. You know, even now, you know, it's been a year. So in 12 months, this game went from a $60 price tag and lost over 90% of its value. Now, in our eyes, we see that as a, a bad thing, but in the developer's eyes, it's a way to get more people into the community. Financially... For depending on who you're looking at, some people may feel like, oh, man, I paid eighty dollars for this. Well, the developers may say, well, three dollars makes sense for people to come in. The YouTuber would also be like, it's also a good deal because more people coming in will watch my video. So like I said, it's a very weird dynamic and we all have to call all these different situations out to be able to get a better understanding for what's actually going on. And so these lessons are very hard lessons that I think I'm going to carry on to, you know, different experiences in terms of gaming, because a lot of people get burned and a lot of people, you know, get get into the excitement and invest in something that they might not be necessarily clear with. And so I've seen a lot of comments of people saying, I'm not buying this year to pass. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass. I'll wait for a sale. And I don't blame them because they feel like they've been burned from year one. If year one was a good proposition, many more people will be happy to buy year two and even buy year one, you know, and buy the game at its, you know, at, at least a, de a decent price, not at a $3 price point. And I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not mad about a $3 price point by any, any means. I went ahead and got myself some physical copies for $5 at GameStop. So I'm not mad at that. I was happy to actually purchase extra copies of the game, but I'm just saying that as a community, we need to be very cautious, a community of gamers. We just need to, you know, hold off a little bit sometimes and then just let the YouTubers make the mistakes. That's what we're here for. You guys are most likely going to even pay us for doing it because you click our videos and you watch it. That's how you pay us. You, we, I'm going to be very honest. We are, I am, and I'm going to speak for myself as a YouTuber. Our work is impossible without a community. So we are kind of, uh, you know, de facto employees of you, the viewer. 
eh, I know it sounds weird. You know, we're kind of our own bosses. We can make videos when we want. But if you don't watch them, then it's a it's a futile effort. So that's, you know, a very solid lesson that I feel like as players, we can take on. Now, if you're a hardcore fan and you don't care, then you know the drill. You're probably already pre-ordered. All you're just doing is just listening to me and smiling, saying, eh, you know how it is. And I feel you, man, because, you know, I'm also going to be getting my copy. I think I'm going to get it like a day before. I usually buy my games. Like a, if I'm going to get it early, me, it means like a day before the game, you know, the, the thing comes out. That's usually how I roll. So God willing, when it's close, I'll be getting my copy, doing my downloads and my update updates. And, you know, we'll be seen in New York. So thank you guys for joining the conversation. I appreciate you guys so much. Don't forget to tune in uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, you know, Central U.S. time. I'll be bringing a premiere for you guys almost every day of the week. I'll see how it, it, it actually goes. And, you know, if you guys are, you know, continue to engage in it, then, you know, I'll, I'll probably add it to my schedule and so on and, you know, and so on. And I, I, you know, from what I see, you guys are really having interactions about all of this. So that probably is a signal for me to continue bringing this to you guys. So thank you very much for, you know, joining and hopping in. I appreciate you guys so much. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.